Okay, hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, session CTD 204. Uh, my name is Kevin Moore. Uh, I am the Director of Product Management uh, at AWS Elemental uh, in charge of live transcoding. So uh, AWS Elemental is a subsidiary of AWS and we focus on video technologies. Um, today's presentation is called uh, All the World's a Stage. Uh, um, and we're going to talk about uh, how OTT video can be used to enhance the process of education and, and sharing knowledge with people around the world. Uh, I'm pleased to have a guest uh, presenter today, Richard Manning. He's the Associate Senior Lecturer uh, in Digital Television Technology from Ravensburn University uh, here from London. Uh, this is actually uh, his first visit to the United States, and I've already informed him that Las Vegas is not representative of the rest of the United States, so we cleared that up. It was it's kind of it's a shocking introduction to the United States, if you ask me. Uh, okay, so um, I want to set the stage here a little bit um, and, and really just talk about the power of the AWS media services, uh, although I focus primarily on the AWS service called Media Live, which is our live transcoding service. Um, we're we're, we're going to be talking about all of them together. Um, we're going to cover the basics of how customers can set up simple streaming workflows. Uh, and um, then we're going to look deeply at how Ravensbourne has used Media Live and the other media services in order to create uh, the, the great experiences that they have for students uh, all over the UK. And then there will be some time for questions and answers too. Um, so, I mean, just by a show of hands, how many people actively run um, streaming video services here today? Uh, okay, so this is a fairly, uh, this is a, a group that's, that's fairly engaged in the topic. Um, the uh, when when we think about the sort of the customer space uh, that's out there, there are certain customers who we classify and who classify themselves as media and entertainment customers. Their business is primarily that of you know building a media service or a media property or you know movies or television or whatever and getting it out there. Uh, I see some of you in the room, but I won't call you out by name right now. Um, this talk is actually a little bit uh, oriented towards um, sort of how AWS media services are useful for the non-media and entertainment company uh, customer. So someone who has the primary focus of their business is not producing digital media, but the ability to produce and distribute digital media can enhance their business. Um, and, and education, of course, is a great uh, is a great example there. So we're going to talk a little bit about the AWS media services for uh, the non-media and entertainment customer. Uh, so given the show of hands of people that are involved in streaming today, this may be a little bit basic, but uh, I'll cover it anyway. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yes, go ahead. I don't know about that. Just my oh, OK. <laughs> uh, OK, so AWS customers of all types want to deliver video to their customers. So video is always a thing that can oftentimes enhance the experience of a core business. So these could be uh, artistic events or training sessions. It could be corporate communication. It could be related to security, so on and so forth. Um, like I said, the, the media itself may not be the core business, but it's something that enhances that core business. Now, when we deliver v video to a customer uh, over the internet, that's called over the top. And this is a term that kind of originated from the broadcast industry uh, a couple of years back where we, where we said, okay, there are the traditional delivery channels, whether that's satellite or cable TV or even over the air in your neighborhood. Um, but now we can also deliver video directly using internet connections. So that became known as over the top delivery. Uh, and oftentimes called OTT for short. And, and really when we talk about the media services, almost all of the time we're talking about delivering that kind of OTT video to be delivered over 
uh, you know, directly over existing internet connections. And it's really key to keep in mind that before the advent of OTT technologies and OTT economics, a lot of the use cases that I talked about at the top of the screen just weren't feasible. You couldn't assemble a big enough audience or the audience you could assemble couldn't pay enough to make it feasible to use traditional broadcast technologies to reach them. So while you might have some great training material that you want to deliver to customers using uh, internet streaming, the cost of you know, printing all that training, stamping all that content onto DVDs and mailing them out to the people that needed to see it was prohibitive, and so it just never got done. Uh, and that's really exciting to us at AWS because uh, you know, being able to bring out new technologies that enable uh, new workflows and, and new ways of doing, doing things is really the name of the game for our customers. So uh, when we think about the video application use cases, uh, you know, there's just sort of some large segments that we, uh, that we can see it falling into. Um, you know, there's a sort of government and security uh, aspect people that are interested in using video for. Uh, live and, and video on demand type services. You know, there's, there's lots of these uh, in the available today. Uh, streaming events, that's, that's really kind of the focus of this uh, presentation here. Uh, you also have gaming or you know, streaming gaming, esports. That's definitely something growing in popularity. Uh, streaming classroom activities. Um, and then just traditional pay TV where you, you subscribe to a service in order to access lots and lots of live and on-demand content. Uh, and so primarily in this talk, we're going to be really focusing on that sort of, the, sort of the intersection of events and the classroom. Um, so again, just to review a couple of the obvious benefits of using the media services inside of AWS as opposed to uh, you know, trying to tackle these problems with uh, the purchase of, of dedicated hardware. Um, so with media services, you basically pay for what you use and you pay as you go. Uh, so you're not making capital expenses, you're making a sort of time variable expense, uh, which is very efficient. Uh, you, you adapt your media storage and compute needs. So what this really means is you're taking advantage of our very high economies of scale. Uh, so because AWS has you know, very, very large data centers, we're able to deliver the computation uh, at, at a very low cost. Uh, the unpredictability and the uh, burstiness is handled natively by media services. Uh, this weekend, you may need to do one event. Next weekend, you may need to do three. In the old world, you would have to buy three sets of encoding equipment in order to do them all at the same time. In the new world, you just create three channels, and when you're done, you, you spin them down. Uh, you can shorten the time to market and test out new approaches. So you, know, you can have launched a service in January, and that can be running. And in March, you can say, you know, I wonder if we did it completely differently. Let's set up a parallel channel with different parameters, and let's see how that works while you leave the existing thing running. So it allows you to really develop a sort of iteration and innovation flywheel, because you always have resources available to test out new approaches. Uh, we have global availability. And uh, I think a, a key uh, premise here is that it all works the same. This is really such a great benefit of the media services, which is that once you get a workflow running in, say, US East 1, uh, that same workflow can basically be transferred to you know, an Asia-Pacific region. And it, it really does just work the same. The, the code versions are the same. The API calls are the same. Everything is really uh, quite uniform, which makes it very, very easy to uh, sort of port that stuff. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, you're able to focus in on the media side of uh, the work and not on the sort of data center, general purpose IT administration part of the work. So that's kind of what we see as, as the primary uh, benefits of using uh, the media services. And you know, when we look at these non-ME customers, these customers that want to produce events, there's a couple of other specific ones that uh, jump out at them. So obviously, uh, 
the AWS media services are not the only way to deliver a stream to a customer. Uh, there are other companies out there that will certainly offer live streaming, um, but typically that's live streaming inside of their platform, and that platform is typically advertising driven, and so there's sort of a desire to run ads alongside or over top of your content. And uh, we we feel that nothing real nothing should get in the way of your relationship with your viewers. So it's very important to us that you can build an entire workflow that's not ad supported in any way. So you control the total experience. Uh, we allow customers to scale with their success. So these these non M and E customers that are kind of getting a toe in the water with video, you know, they can do one classroom, one session, one one series of lectures, uh, they can deliver that, and then as that's successful, they can scale that up. Um, and most importantly, you know, when the semester's over or what have you, everything can be shut off and no, no cost has accrued, either in the form of depreciation or direct cost. Uh, additionally, um, there's a very low barrier to entry. So there's no special contracts that need to be signed. There's no long-term commitment. Um, you don't have to order anything, and you can build workflows in any region just using the AWS console, or if you're really adventurous, using the API or the SDK. Uh, and then lastly, the AWS media services make the same video technology available to all customers. So although I'm focusing on the non-M&E customer segment here, it's not that we have a media service for you know the the premium video operator, and then we have a different media service for uh, someone who's doing simple streaming in the same way that there's not one S3 for people who use a lot and one S3 for people who use a little. It's the same technology made available to everybody, uh, which we think is a great thing. So uh, I've talked about how easy and accessible this is, and I wanted to sort of give a very basic example here for uh, for what would be involved in, in setting this up. Um, and it's really very simple. There's just three services that you connect together and you have a sort of worldwide streaming distribution setup. So the first service that's worth um, talking about, and this will sort of lay this out from the middle going out. So uh, we have this service, AWS Elemental Media Store. And what that is, uh, is an origin server. So an origin server is basically where your CDN and your encoder meet. Your encoder creates segmented content periodically every few seconds across multiple bit rates and puts it in the origin uh, store. And then the uh, CDN, when the players request content, the CDN comes to that store and asks for it. Now, it's very important that this be extremely low latency, that it be high availability, uh, and that it be very durable. Um, and the latency really matters because if the origin is you know, sometimes stuttering and not able to give that content, then you need to increase the overall end-to-end -end latency to deal with that. So when we built Media Store, we really focused on that low latency piece, and it has really good, uh, not only low jitter numbers, but also very low uh, sorry, not only does it have low latency numbers, but it also has a very low latency jitter. So it's both low and predictable. Uh, configuring Media Store is very easy. Uh, you go, this is just a screenshot from the AWS console here. There's that big create container button on the right. For every container you've created, you are given a URL. It lives in whatever region you want it to live in. Uh, and then you basically can just take that URL and put it in both the encoder and the CDN, and, and the two have met then. Uh, the next step in the workflow, again, starting from the middle and going out towards the players, is uh, CloudFront. So Media Store works with all CDNs. We happily originate content uh, to be delivered not only to our own CDN, but those CDNs from other providers in industry. Um, but it's very easy to configure and set up with CloudFront. Uh, CloudFront is really extremely uh, straightforward. You don't have to talk to anybody to set it up. It's all API and console driven. Um, this is an example of what the CloudFront user interface looks like. 
this is a, a CloudFront distribution that I made. And a distribution is basically just a way of saying, I want to serve the content that's currently in this media store container to the world at this uh, endpoint address. And uh, it really is a worldwide thing. It takes care of you know, finding the optimal path from the edge locations back to that, uh, to that origin. Um, so you can see here the, uh, a player that was pointed at that domain name uh, would serve content out of that origin. And so again, that blue create distribution button is all that you need. You answer a few questions and then your, your CloudFront distribution is being created. And then of course, uh, the last thing that you need is the transcoder. So Media Live is an adaptive bitrate transcoder. Um, so I, I think there's general familiarity of, about this concept, but of course, when we do OTT video, we don't just run one transcode, we run a large number at the same time, typically five or maybe even seven, sometimes more transcodes. And that's you know the largest screen size, your 1080p 30, uh, you might do a 720, you might do a 540, 360, uh, where that's the number of lines in each picture. So it's progressively smaller and smaller pictures at lower and lower bit rates. And we do that so that when the, the customer who's receiving this video over the internet gets into a bandwidth challenged state, they always have a piece of content they can go to uh, as, as they're bandwidth is constrained more and more. They always have something they can reach for and still get over that pipe, even if it's impaired. And so Media Live is the encoder that does exactly that. It's basically a one in to n out transcoder, where n is typically five or seven or something like that. Uh, and so those are the three services that go together. Uh, in the same way, Media Live is very easy to configure. This is the create channel page. Uh, so you give your channel a name, uh, you tell it where the input comes from. You can see on output groups over there, I've got my, my individual outputs here. You can see three of them in this screenshot. Uh, you tell MediaLive that you want uh, an input type. It'll give you the input IP address and you tell MediaLive where to send the content, in this case, your media store bucket. Uh, then, of course, uh, the three services together uh, don't complete the whole picture. You uh, get some playback devices, whether it's just a browser on a desktop or you know, an iOS device or something like that. You point them at the CloudFront distribution URLs. And then, of course, you're going to need a source. Uh, and so that source can come from a single camera. It can be as simple as an app running on a phone that streaming like over RTMP can be delivered to Media Live. Many of our customers do just that. Uh, so you know the thing on the left end and the right end of this could be as simple as two phones. Uh, so there's a lot of options there, and of course uh, that can range anything from a small video production setup like what we have going here, uh, all the way down to like I said, a piece of phone software. Um, so that's that. That's basically just a, a quick walkthrough to show how easy it is to chain those three services together and end up with a scalable worldwide scaling solution, uh, streaming solution that's ready to be used uh, for any type of event workload and um, that's really sort of pay by, by the hour and pay for each uh, delivered byte. So, um, and then the last point that I wanted to make here uh, before introducing our guest is um, that it's easy to get started with media services, but it's also easy to grow in sophistication over time. So what I showed here is, is basically a copy of the channel of, of, of what we just showed. So in this case, we're using uh, our on-prem product. Uh, many people don't know that AWS can actually ship you a server. We can in the form of AWS Elemental Live, which is our live transcoding server, which we ship to customers all over the world. Um, so that is the on-prem encoder that's contributing to Media Live, Media Store, and then CloudFront. Um, a more sophisticated approach to this is actually instead of using Media Store, 
You can bring media package into the equation. So media package is another origin product that we have that brings additional features, features like adding DRM, encryption, content protection, taking live assets and turning them into uh, VOD assets that can be watched later. So this is very popular for event-based workflows. A basketball game can end, and then you can turn that segment of time into a URL that you could hand out to anybody later, uh, anybody, and then later they can watch that game from the beginning. Uh, and then you can also bring in our product, Media Tailor, which is a product that does server-side ad insertion. So I think we've all experienced when uh, what's called player-side ad insertion, and we've all experienced it when it's not very good. You're watching video, you come to the commercial break, the player just sort of like freezes for a minute, and then like some clearly new content shows up, different audio levels, all kinds of problems. It's not a great experience. Uh, Media Tailor does all of that on the server side, so you get a really smooth broadcast-like experience. Uh, and like I said, it's more sophisticated. Um, but it, it shows a way in which people that have kind of gotten into the streaming business can grow in sophistication over time. And then, of course, we can't forget about the on-demand workflow. Typically, if you have a lot of live content that's interesting to people, you also have some on-demand content that's interesting to people. So this is video that's not happening now. It might have been the live events from the previous month or so, and you want to make those available in a catalog form. And the media services... Uh, accomplish that as well. So simple to get started, but easy to grow in sophistication over time. Okay, so uh, that's that. At this point, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Richard, and he is going to tell you about how they used AWS Elemental Media Services uh, in their education workflow. So thank you very much. There you go, sir. Sorry about that. Um, start again. Um, I'm Richard Manning. I'm one of the Associate Senior Lecturers at Ravensbourne University London on the Digital Television Technology course. We are a small university, um, and actually we've just been awarded university status in the UK um, this September. So this is the first year that we're actually running our own validated curriculum as well. Um, we've got around about 2,000 students, and we specialize in design and media. And we really focus on the idea of mindsets and skill sets in the process of actually giving the students the skills that they need to go out into the world and actually use the products, but also actually the right type of thinking. It's not just a case of we want this product because it does some great stuff. It's like, why are you wanting to use it? And also, how do we actually implement it in a way that's not going to disrupt everything else that we've done before? So we came up with an opportunity. Uh, we had an opportunity uh, around about this time last year. And I'll explain that in a little bit um, as we go further down. Um, but. This opportunity also arose in the sense that we do a lot of things at Ravensbourne where we get our students to actually be at the front and center of delivering content. Um, we have the degree show, which I'll talk about in a bit, but also we've got this collaboration with the Royal Shakespeare Company's education department with their live schools broadcasts. Um, the project itself, um, we uh, provide uh, content to um, schools in the UK for free, and any school can actually sign up as well. And also, we want to extend the use of all of the things that we've learned with AWS Elemental to give streaming provisions for all Ravensbourne events. So to begin with, I want to say that actually I come from an HD SDI background. That's what we deliver at Ravensbourne. Um, we've got a full baseband infrastructure. And the last link in that is actually a AWS Elemental Live um, encoder. Um, but actually, we had no knowledge of cloud provisions before we got started with this. Um, I'm going to hand this over to two of my students, because they were at the front and center of this actually as we went into it. And actually, all three of us didn't know what we were doing. Um, the first day we sat around the table and got going, we learned of this thing called uh, IAM. And we was like, well, what's this? 
and straight onto YouTube and all the um, support networks that are available with AWS. And we managed to actually, at the end of three hours, actually get everything implemented and we started going into the actual media live products or the AWS Elemental Media Lives. I'm Warren Lafayette and I'm managing Livestream. Um, I'm Mara Sandu and I'm managing Livestream. The help we received from AWS Elemental was quite substantial. Initially they came to us after we were researching uh, other methods of uh, live streaming because we were initially just using social media which wasn't really effective. So then we moved on to looking at other methods and after looking at some they, they emailed us after we didn't put our email to get a textbook or something and uh, Richard Manning started talking to them discussing um, potential projects. We set up a meeting with the accounting manager Paul Selly and the solutions architect Nuno Quental and we spoke about um, the workflow of how we were going like, to execute um, working with the RDC. Because initially we were struggling to figure out what AWS services we'd require and they came along and actually showed us exactly what we require like we can either go for a more advanced workflow or start with a simple one and over time we've gone for the more advanced one and it's actually it's been really effective we can see all, how everything works exactly nothing's hidden it's all like it's all on the UI and, the, and the, we can control it all through the control panel on AWS it's really great using the AWS console was at first daunting however once actually using it and working on the actual platform it was not, it was easier, and also with um, the availability with the Elemental community, it helped us achieve what we wanted. Yeah, like she said, especially after we got help from Paul and Nuno and the customer support, it, it all seemed so much clearer. We, we were uh, surprised how, how daunting it seemed at first, because it seemed like, oh, we didn't know where we were going, but once they sort of lay out that path for you, it's easy to walk, as per se. Well, it was very helpful when supporting the RSC project, because um, it revolutionized the workflow because beforehand it was simply streaming from the elemental that we have here in Ravensbourne to uh, like social medias and it was very simple Every, a lot of the video processing was behind like closed doors we couldn't see and manage specific aspects and uh, AWS's services opened up a lot of those doors so we could manage the different um, different ways con the people receive the content and uh, we could see the analytics of uh, our viewers and we could manage exactly how, what uh, bit rates and uh, resolutions of our viewers were viewing the video as well. So before I get going, actually the um, textbook that um, Warren said that we actually were trying to download was the white paper of the products launched last year. At, um, at AWS re-event, um, and this actually began the story where we're going. And before we move on and I start talking about how we used this for the Royal Shakespeare Company, I want to point out that we went from no knowledge to a working workflow in four months, um, and we were quite impressed by that. And actually, we went into a kind of real, we tested it on a minor scale, but we went into a pretty major live event, which I'm now going to talk a little bit with you. So as I've mentioned a little while ago, the Royal Shakespeare Company is a collaboration between uh, Ravensbourne and their education department. We um, take RSC captured content. Um, so some of you might have seen their um, RSC live from Stratford at cinemas. Um, we take that content and we split that up into three parts to fit into the school curriculum and breaks. We've got um, students ranging from year two, which is around about um, age of six, all the way up to 18. So the actual demographic for this is actually quite large. Um, so before AWS Elemental, um, and there's actually kind of two parts to this that I want to talk about. Um, the collaboration with them has been going on since around about 2012, 2013. Um, and it was a three-part relationship between RSC, JISC, and Ravensbourne. Um, and the, um, we had a third-party streaming provider. But one of the issues that we kept coming up to was that schools were reporting massive streaming issues, uh, buffering images not coming up, audio not coming up sometimes. And actually, this is specifically important because we do a British Sign Language feed as well, um, where we like hit around about 20 st um, schools each time. And this is actually one of the RSC's outreach programs, what they're actually very proud of, because it's actually bringing Shakespeare's work to larger audiences. Um, 
for us as educators, um, it was actually somewhat annoying because we weren't able to investigate the issue. We was following the specifications that were set out by us for us, and we felt that we was actually doing everything right on our part, and actually a lot of the blame was coming not completely our way, but we couldn't answer the questions that were coming back, and that's not a nice position to be in. Um, around about summer 2017, the relationships changed a little bit, and it was decided that we would be using social media platforms. Um, we tried this out, um, and actually the majority of schools were able to watch, but we actually had an issue with actual school filtering, um, where schools couldn't actually get the live streams because some, somewhere along their line is a issue with their filtering. Um, and I don't know if many people know about the UK education system. Some places have very well-equipped IT departments. Other places will have one person shared between 30, 40 schools. It's just dependent on the local authority, and we, we, we don't actually have any input in that. So that's, again, that was a very like, horrible place for us to be in because we knew that there were schools out there not able to watch this amazing educational content. So as we go into it, so as I said before, we was doing a lot of this to look at everything for Ravensbourne, for our learners in, at Ravensbourne, but our main priority was actually creating a solution for one of our clients. And this is what we uh, had to go with. So it streamed to schools and home loan learners. And once again, a teacher isn't an IT department. They just know that they have to get onto a website, click play. Um, and it's actually the same with a lot of the home learners. These are parents delivering um, educational content or educational groups. Um, they might not be completely technically minded. So it has to be simple and it has to be a solution that we could rely on. Um, bandwidth limitations. Um, and actually, I'm going to combine, combine this into geographical issues as well. Um, if some of you know about the UK, we've got the highlands up in Scotland. It's some of the remotest parts of our country. They're not near the um, fibre backbone exchange that BT has rolled out. Um, and also um, the Channel Islands, Isle of Man and Northern Ireland. And this creates some issues for us because actually the schools aren't going to be as close to networks as they possibly can. Um, the urban areas, we could pretty much safely say that they were going to have quite good connections, but then again, there is complexity with the learning grids. And as with all art budgets and educational budgets, we were limited by finance. And actually, this is kind of where this project's really great, is because we've got such amazing outreach for this, actually giving the creative arts uh, a place. So this video is going to start, and this is just some of the behind the scenes elements of where we're um, the RSC project. And I want you to kind of focus on the fact of how many students are working on this and also the equipment that we use. We're training up students on industry standard products and obviously we're trying to start upgrading that to the latest sort of versions of things. But um, we try and replicate industry practices as much as we can. And once again, uh, students are empowered to actually be at front and centre of this. I'm Fiona Ingram, I'm Head of Education Programmes at the Royal Shakespeare Company. We're showing Romeo and Juliet, and it's actually our biggest broadcast so far. We've got about 122,000 students um, signed up to watch it. Now, Romeo and Juliet, as with Macbeth that we streamed this year already, are the most studied plays from Shakespeare. So we know that a lot of schools are going to study them those books are going to be on their shelves and they're going to study them in quite a set way. Now what we've got is a, a production of Romeo and Juliet for the 21st century. So it's a contemporary production, it's talking about knife crime. We've also got a lot of young people in it, there's about young people falling in love, we all know about that. And it's got a lot of young people that are in it and also driving that story forward. So it's a contemporary production. We've also got our two main characters, so uh, Bally Gill, who plays Romeo, and Karen Fishwick, who plays Juliet, in the studio, answering questions from all the students that have been sent around from around the country, and also it's anchored by a practitioner from the education department who guides the students through the, sh the day. They're sat down watching three hours of Shakespeare, it's quite tough. What, what we can do is help them with that viewing, and also we have a professional presenter who takes them on that journey as well. So this is around about two months of planning with the students, uh, weekly production meetings, as well as this is actually the, um, the transition year. 
So the third year students are actually passing on knowledge down to their second year students at the My moment. Name is Graham and I am the student technical manager for the RSC project. The opportunity it gives you as a student is like second to none really. The experience you get from this working with a professional company really sets you apart whenever you go actually into the industry. Um, it's just a great thing to have in a CV too. So our students are at the front and centre of the live Q&A. We make sure that that's delivered properly so every single school can actually get the questions answered what they want to as well. Um, and I hope you can see that actually all of the students are quite dedicated to this. Um, they know that they've got to raise the bar for the RSC because they're expecting a professional service from us. I'm, I'm Nicholas Anderson. I am the sound supervisor. Something that I find really interesting about working with the Royal Shakespeare Company is uh, they're outside, so they have industry expectations, um, and we have to work to that. Uh, so we basically have to up our game. Um, it's a real learning opportunity to learn from industry professionals. Um, and as naturally as some of you are fully aware that working in a live environment can actually be quite stressful and tough. You're kind of one second away from it sometimes falling over. And these students are kind of proactive, is that they're trying to always kind of come up with results. Um, this recent broadcast, we had a few issues with the amount of questions coming into our system and that created a backlog with our graphic system and our students, it was stressful but in the end they did manage to actually provide it. And what was nice is the one thing that we could rely on this was the stream that we were putting out and that it was going to schools which I'll touch on in a little minute as well. So yeah, these are a few of the students over the years. So looking at about 30 students every single year working on this project, and they're going out into industry with actually uh, real experience with this. Um, education settings can be have a go, make a mistake, let's evaluate what did we learn from it. And actually around this is actually they've got a live audience, so you can't mess up on screen. Um, and there has been some horror stories over the years before I actually came onto the project. And I'm not saying that I've helped move along because we still have issues. They are second year students, uh, around about 19, 20 years old. Um, and going out with that sort of experience is incredible. So this is the workflow that we implemented for the Macbeth broadcast. Um, and this is what we kind of created after four months of learning about AWS Elemental Services. Um, as I mentioned, we've got a HD SDI um, system at Ravensbourne. Um, it's at 50i, so we do 25 frames per second if it was progressive, um, and that's the European standard what we work with. And kind of a key point here is that we have two parallel streams happening. We've got the main feed, and then also the British Sign Language feed going onto that. We then use the uh, AWS Elemental Live encoder, and we create um, six RTMP streams. So that's two for each um, pipeline, for the main, two for the BSL, and then we also have redundancy for social what's going to social media. Because we've had so many problems in the past with um, the um, streams, we still use a redundancy because we've got one person sitting up at the RSC that is the single point of contact for all of the schools watching. Um, they're not technical, so they need to get things quickly on it. Um, and I'm nice to say that actually since we've implemented this um, workflow, we've had no schools reporting on the day that there is a streaming issue. Um, so it's something that's actually quite reliable for us. Um, we then send it to Media Live, where we put it into TN2224 specification. We went with that one because there was one of the drop-down menus on the Media Live page, um, but actually doing research and looking at school photos, what gets sent in, we realized that a lot of the home learners are actually watching on mobile devices, um, which is actually quite interesting because we recommend actually putting it on a big whiteboard at the front of the classroom. And actually, this is where we started learning that there was different ways of watching it and how our audience was watching it. Um, we then sent it to Media Package, which is a little bit of an overkill at the moment, but we're getting our students ready for um, moving it over to MPEG Dash, um, which is going to be used more for OTT services, and we want to get our students around, um, head around what's actually going on there, because this is the world that they'll be going into in the next two years, where it's probably going to become a lot more established. We use the uh, AWS CloudFront, um, and then we um, 
our part of the leg is we send it to a video.js player. Um, one of the key parts of this as well is that on the destination is a uh, website that was developed from the early days of this by one of the students who was working on the project. When he graduated, he actually spun off a company which is still developing educational platforms, what we're still using for the RSC project today. Sorry, that's gone. So the first big use of it was Macbeth, and we managed to hit over 82,000 school children, um, 645 schools, which 22 of them was BSL, um, which is an incredible thing. So uh, like, we know that these students were watching it. Um, we had 13.3 terabytes over the CDN, and this was the first time that we actually realized how big these broadcasts were in terms of data. We'd never seen that before because everything had been behind closed doors. And what we was um, looking at the CDN popular objects, we was able to see that 63% received the highest quality stream which was at a 1080p at 8 megabits per second. As I said a while back, we had no schools reporting streaming issues, and one of the recommendations is that we recommend to watch it on a, one particular browser. We realized that actually our audience are watching on four or five different browsers and also these mobile devices. So it's actually changed the way that we look at the workflow a little bit. Um, for this recent Romeo and Juliet broadcast, which was just this Wednesday, um, we didn't get the full number that F um, Fiona mentioned in the video, but we did hit over 66,000 school children. Um, we had slightly less going over to CDN. We made a few little refinements on the actual output of Media Live, where we took out some of the lower bit rate um, variants because there was no point because we realized actually from the data of the previous one, we didn't need to include them. And as you can see on the CDN, um, HLS underscore one is our top rated stream going out. And um, the vast majority of schools were actually getting the highest quality one. And again, as I was saying, that, that this is great because we know that every single school didn't have an issue with the stream. So we know that, that the content going out of it was actually um, safe. And also, we, weren't, we had knowledge in that, that we, everything else that might have been going slightly wrong at the time, we knew that the stream was going out perfectly. Um, and actually, this is actually kind of twofold, where we need to think about the importance of that, is that we've actually got RSC captured content. And these are some of the best in the business in the UK. So we need to make sure that their content is going out safely. It's their IP. It's not ours. And also, our students are learning some real world experience from this. Um, so just a few more kind of photos from the RSC project, and it's just seeing some of the crew as we go through it over time. Um, I think that's kind of like our big use. We get a lot of audience on that, and that's where um, we need to make sure it's kind of going well. Um, for us at Ravensbourne, we also have another event that we're very proud of, which is the uh, Degree Show. This has actually been running for around about 30, 40 years. Um, it used to be just with the television department where it was called Rave On Air or Rave Live. There's been multiple iterations. Um, and one of the key points of this is that we actually get our students to have an Ofcom license, which um, for people who, um, who don't know, Ofcom is the Office of Communication, which is a UK broadcasting regulator. And we actually get the students to sign the document saying that they're safe to actually broadcast it. So that's looking at watershed, if the content is appropriate. And these students actually run this channel for three days now. Um, and these are second year students, once again. Um, we have some input and we have guidance with them. But ultimately, it's their choices that actually kind of win through. Um, and I've got a video here that's actually going to hopefully show you a little bit of the energy that Ravenspawn students put into their projects. Nearly every single department at Ravensbourne is actually represented in this video. Um, so we've had the ones we can talk about is TV and technology, but we've also got photography, um, motion graphics as it's going over the screen. Um, these are all the editing and post-production facilities that we have, training up students for editing in television and also feature films. Um, and a lot of our students go into the Soho post houses. 
Um, and also, as, you, as we're looking at the video, you can see that we actually operate in an open plan environment. We have very few classrooms. It does have its own issues with teaching, um, noise especially, but it does mean that our students can work with each other and actually some very innovative um, things come out of it. So one of the things as well what we do is we make sure all of our students on the engineering department or digital television technology now, and we do a live outside broadcast. We've recently moved over to cellular bonding for this, or it used to be a fibre link back to the building as well. So there are kind of main uses that we're getting from this uh, AWS elemental uh, workflows. Um, and ultimately what we're hoping to do is actually kind of embed this further now. So um, as of probably um, the next academic year, all students on the digital television technology course are actually going to be enrolled onto the AWS Academy. Um, training for the staff is beginning next year, and that will mean that they'll come out of university with AWS fundamentals and cloud architecture certification. Um, we're looking at further refinements to the workflow. It's one of the reasons why I'm at this event as well, to actually learn some knowledge from everybody here to try and reduce latency and to improve kind of the outputs, what we're doing. Um, this also means that we've now got a transmission schedule or transmission workflow where we can actually put research grants on top of that. And the big thing that we're doing is that we're moving from having the students run a three-day broadcasting event and we want them to be running a 24-7 broadcast channel. A lot of that's going to be pre-recorded, but we want to be doing live sections every single day. And we're now in talks with trying to get Ofcom to give us a special license for that as well. So that it's not just a student TV channel, this is real world and that our students come out with those expertise. So just to kind of recap, um, what's nice for us is that we now know that we can provide reliable streams to most locations globally. Um, students are using industry standard technologies and uh, more importantly, we're excited to use AWS with our students learning. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. microphone on. There we go. <laughs> All right. More of a video guy than an audio guy, I guess. So uh, any questions for either Richard or I? Uh, we're happy to answer them. Don't be shy. Steve, I feel like you have a question right on your lips, and you just <laughs> don't know if you can go first. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about student reaction to being exposed to AWS? Because certainly media services is like one little corner of AWS. Um, I think it's like for our students especially, it's like, and some of you are probably aware that educational budgets are actually probably quite stretched as well, like in most places globally. And actually giving the students access to so many powerful products in one place is incredible. Um, Warren, who you saw on the video, is he's been spending the summer looking at every single product and he's now doing his final major project around machine learning, which Ravenspawn would not have the budget in the past to be able to provide that sort of level of um, infrastructure, should we say, um, and now he can sit there and think about doing this as his final major project. And as he was saying, spin things up. If it starts costing too much, he'll spin things down, and he can actually manage that. And we give him a small budget of £75 to do their final major projects, and actually he says that he's putting more of his own money because he's really excited to be playing around with this. Very cool. Question? Yes. Speaking of budget, can you just touch on what is your cost? Um, Okay, so for um, the Macbeth broadcast, yeah. um, we did have a slight, um, it wasn't mentioned that because it was a, um, we did a live lesson the week before using the same workflow, but this was our main kind of big use for it. Um, we, it cost us around about 1,600 pound. 
Um, as I said, leading into this November broadcast, we reduced some of the outputs so that with um, uh, Media Live, it, we had less outputs, which was costing us less. Um, interestingly, actually, because the pound going down at the moment a little bit, actually the cost for the streaming cost 1,500. Most of our costs are actually within the CDN on the day. Um, and just to kind of mention that as well, is that um, the week before the broadcast, we do test week. This is where we run the stream from nine to five, um, and we um, allow schools to go through and test it. Um, with an AWS education account, the cloud, um, the cloud front was actually kind of provided by AWS education, um, and on the broadcast day, it was long. Yeah, and this is a, this is a very common pattern. Uh, if you have a large viewership event, your CDN costs tend to dominate uh, your streaming costs. Um, if your workflow is that you're encoding a lot of streams that each have small viewership, then uh, your your live transcoding costs will tend tend to dominate. Um, but the nice property of uh, sort of the way we price our CDN is that you basically pay for what you deliver. So it's it's typically very easy to um, sort of justify those expenses, and there's not a lot of wastage. Uh, okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, on your uh, first encoding pass, uh, you tell us you use elemental machine, right? Uh -huh. um, uh, do you look for something else or something cheaper than like a software you tell before? Or a... Um, no, because actually we've, we've had this product for a long time in Ravenspawn. Oh, you already have it? Yeah, um, it was... Um, a, a purchase made before I was actually a lecturer at Ravenspawn. Um, we've been using it ever since. Um, admittedly, um, we haven't actually upgraded the firmware recently, so it's probably like something that we need to kind of get upon. Um, but it's been reliable, and we've got a fully functional C, um, CAR at Ravenspawn, which our students operate within, and um, all the equipment that you saw in the gallery in the videos, it's our students, or engineering students, learn how to actually operate safely within a CAR as well. So yeah, it was already a part of our... Yeah, yeah, no, um, I think, um, I can't say what the future holds, but yeah, it's because we've already had it, and that's why we went with it. And we have, um, we have other customers who use just a huge variety of source encoders to give us the content, whether it's uh, a pure software encoder like OBS running on a laptop that's very popular for people that are doing eSports, whether it's a mobile encoder running in a phone delivering RTMP directly, or whether it's a sort of dedicated purpose-built box anywhere from, you know, a small multi-hundred dollar kind of throwdown box all the way to you know, multiple tens of thousands of dollars broadcast contribution encoders. And we're, we're happy that our, our media live transcoder can really accommodate that great diversity of sources. Okay, anything else? Uh, great, well with that we'll wrap up uh, a few minutes early here. Uh, I did wanna call out there are some related sessions uh, that are going on, uh, other presenters. Um, so uh, tomorrow we have uh, 317, which is another uh, customer talk. That'll be back here just two rooms away. Um, uh, and then uh, we have a 400 level workshop where in a two hour session, if this seems interesting to you, you basically say like, wow, I wanna be like Richard. I wanna do what they did. Uh, we can get it done for you in two hours with uh, a bunch of guides in the room ready to, to help you. Uh, so yeah, that'll be that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.